Hello, and thank you for attending our webinar uh, today, Building Envelope Inspection. Uh, this webinar was intended to be uh, provided today at 9 a.m. and due to technical difficulties, uh, was not able to be uh, presented online. Uh, since we were all set up to, to uh, produce the webinar, we decided to go ahead and record it in case uh, someone needs the information uh, sooner. Uh, we did reschedule this webinar for August 18th at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, we did it later in the day to accommodate our West Coast uh, participants. And I apologize to those that were uh, in line to, to watch this webinar uh, this morning. Uh, we actually had people all the way from Seattle, Washington to St. Catherine Parish, Jamaica, and everywhere in between. Uh, before I get started, uh, I just want to mention a couple housekeeping items. Um, one is if I'm going to be playing some videos with sound, and if you have any problems uh, with the sound or the video, I suggest you just try refreshing uh, your connection. Um, and then uh, ordinarily we'd have a chat box for questions, uh, which won't be available to you via this recording. So. I'll be providing my email address uh, at the end of the presentation. Feel free to email me and we'll get uh, do our best to get an answer uh, back to you. Um, it is said that a uh, piece of uh, building facade, which is part of the envelope, falls off a building about once every three weeks. And unfortunately, it takes uh, death or significant destruction to encourage local jurisdictions to institute uh, facade ordinances. Um, there are a number of private owners that we'll talk about uh, that take it upon themselves to institute a facade uh, uh, protection um, ordinance uh, internally um, in order to minimize their liability um, exposure to things falling off of buildings. And it could be parking structures or, or buildings themselves uh, in hurting people. So today we're gonna to talk about uh, why uh, it's important to be looking at your facade. Um, we're also gonna be talking about the entire building envelope because the facade in many respects uh, is, is part of the envelope and a lot of the deficiencies uh, begin uh, with the building envelope and find, them ways, find their way to the facade. Um, your facade, uh, basically, and, and building envelope protect your building from the environment, humidity, rain, snow, ice, temperature extremes, ultraviolet radiation, groundwater. Uh, and so we're expecting a lot from our uh, building envelope and the different parts of your envelope uh, have to interface together. Uh, they all behave uh, differently. Uh, they expand and contract differently. Uh, you need to accommodate for that. Uh, we're going to talk about how you inspect a facade as well as the roof. Uh, as I mentioned, the roof oftentimes is the source of your problems uh, with your facade. And then we'll lightly touch uh, on reporting. Uh, I'm Scott Weiland, um, the presenter uh, for today. Um, I graduated at the University of Michigan. I've been uh, in the design and construction business for about 40 years. Uh, the firm I have now, uh, Innovative Engineering, we have offices in Seattle, Washington, Atlanta, Georgia, and Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, personally, I share time between our Seattle office and Atlanta office. Um, been working with uh, building facades for probably 25 years. I have authored a number of articles and spoken on this topic uh, numerous times. Before we get too far here, uh, just for you that maybe don't know the difference between an envelope and a facade, um, the building envelope is just that. It's, it, it totally encompasses the building on all six sides. You can see the blue line on the left, uh, not only goes across the roof, but down the walls, but it also goes all the way underneath the foundations and the slab, because groundwater is also a significant aspect of of facades and facades can actually wick up water uh, from the ground and that leads to deterioration in the facade. 
The facade comes from a French word, meaning the, the face of the building facing the public. Uh, we're gonna be looking at all faces, uh, but you can see uh, from the image there that basically everything above grade all the way to the roof is, is the facade. Um, you pretty much cannot look at the facade without considering the whole entire envelope. And that's the reason why I include a segment today on, in looking at the roof and that we entitled this uh, seminar um, with the word envelope and not just a facade. One of the more recent uh, cities to adopt a uh, facade ordinances, ordinance was Cleveland. And uh, this is a photograph taken in 2015. A father and four boys had just parked their car 10 minutes earlier to go to dinner before a Cleveland Cavaliers game. Uh, they blamed this on high wind, but the, the wind was, you know, it was a gust of wind, but not, not significant. And uh, a piece of the uh, cornice fell uh, 11 stories and, um, and, and dam did damage to this car. You can imagine if there were people in there, they probably would have been injured, uh, if not killed. Um, this is an example in Atlanta uh, where we have an office. Um, this is a facade on the front of a, it looks like a metal building, but it's a, uh, it's a retail center and uh, that's a chiropractic clinic. Ironically, the woman was leaving uh, the chiropractic clinic. The facade fell on her, uh, buried her. Uh, she was transported to the hospital complaining of neck and back injury. Uh, the occupants of the building were trapped until they could push the door open and, and unbury uh, the woman. This is a video that was caught on security camera. And um, this is another facade failure uh, in Atlanta. And we'll play this and hopefully you'll get the video as well as the sound. If not, uh, feel free to refresh your connection. This. In the last hour, we got this security camera video of a building facade crashing to the ground. You can see right there a driver swerving to avoid it. Channel 2's Tom Regan is live on Pryor Street in downtown Atlanta. Tom, people there think heavy rain caused the facade to come down. Dave, the sidewalk here on Pryor Street remains closed. You can see the debris piled up here from the fallen facade. It broke off. From way up there early this morning, and a short time ago, Atlanta police kindly provided us with dramatic street security camera video of what happened. There's just been so much water, it just caved in. Karen King suspects the torrential rains this week weakened the cornice molding that has adorned her family's building since the 1980s. Early Friday morning, a section of the ornamental siding broke off and crashed onto the sidewalk. The building is in very good shape. It's just being pummeled by day after day of rain. It just it crashed, it, it rotted and crashed down. Just heard a loud noise. Alan Taylor was working across the street when the molding ripped off the side of the building and fell to the ground. It's a direct hit right on the sidewalk. It looks like water damage on the plywood top under, under the copper, copper ledge. Another construction worker told me part of the falling facade damaged a couple of vehicles in front of the building. There was a uh, SUV and a truck sitting there when it came crashing down and it landed on top of the SUV. Many witnesses said it's remarkable the large structure didn't hit anyone walking by. We are very, feel very lucky that nobody was hurt. We are calling structural engineers, we're calling emergency crews to come clean up the mess, and then hopefully the city of Atlanta will allow us to open the front of the building so our clients can get inside. A city engineer told me the damaged facade didn't affect any other area of the building, so it was allowed to remain open. Live in downtown Atlanta, Tom Regan, Channel 2, Action News. I'm sure you saw the person on the left uh, walking up toward the building. Uh, had they just been a little bit quicker, this uh, facade, a cornice, would likely have landed on them. Um, heavy rain was blamed. Uh, however, uh, had there been facade inspections done, uh, you would have, you would have uh, tactily uh, touched that uh, cornice piece and, uh, and you would have known that it was loose and uh, it could have been, you know, re-secured. Uh, so it's another reason to have, uh, to do uh, inspection of your facade. Um, this is another condition uh, also in Atlanta. 
this was uh, an article uh, based on this, uh, was the streets in downtown Atlanta were closed. Pretty high profile case. Uh, we were on the phone daily with the mayor's office and we were called in to investigate this uh, failure. Uh, there was metal panels that uh, were falling off of a 34 story building. And um, this is a video uh, taken, one, one of many. Um, we'll go ahead and play this. You can see why they uh, decided to close the streets off. Uh, it was blamed on wind as a result of Tropical Depression Irma in, in 2017. However, the wind speeds uh, recorded were about 40 miles per hour. The design wind speed for Atlanta is 90 miles per hour. Uh, so you really can't blame it on the wind. Uh, what we determined through our investigation was there was uncoated screws used uh, that corroded. Uh, and then there was also uh, some metal clips that uh, suffered um, from some fatigue uh, damage. Fortunately, no one was killed and we were able to secure the panels on the top of this 34 story building so the streets of Atlanta could be reopened. Uh, currently, there's 12 uh, cities that have uh, facade ordinances. Uh, the oldest one uh, was uh, created in 1976 in Chicago, uh, later repealed and then reinstituted in 1996. Uh, there's a model law that is uh, ASTM E2270, uh, standard practice for periodic inspection of building facades for unsafe conditions. Um, the buildings that are, that fall, are subject to that inspection uh, vary by jurisdiction. Uh, generally, uh, it calls for them to be inspected both visually and tactily, in other words, hands-on uh, every five years. You can see there's a lot of them kind of in the rust belt there. Uh, in San Francisco, it was included. Uh, Atlanta, as you can see, is, is not exempt uh, from having uh, facade failures. Um, and uh, there's a lot of owners that we do work for, primarily the Veterans Administration. Uh, they own uh, facilities all across the, the country, uh, also, you know, out of, out of the, you know, Oconus, uh, Puerto Rico, Guam, places like that. And they uh, have an internal program of, of inspecting, uh, quote, high rise buildings larger than, uh, taller than eight stories. Uh, we do a lot of facade inspection uh, coast to coast. Uh, the CDC is another client. Uh, we do uh, quite a few inspections for them uh, out uh, even to the Midwest or to the Western part of the United States, as well as uh, here at their campus uh, in Atlanta. Hotel chains as part of their risk reduction program, and then uh, universities. Now, just because you don't have a facade ordinance doesn't mean that you are exempt from uh, having to maintain the facade of your building. Uh, the International Property Maintenance Code is a voluntary code. Uh, in Georgia, they call it a permissive code. Uh, and this permissive code um, is law if it's adopted by the local uh, building authority, uh, which it is uh, most places in Georgia. Uh, Atlanta appears to have their own uh, commercial maintenance and industrial code, uh, which is very similar. Uh, the ordinance requires you to maintain the exterior of your building in a structurally sound and sanitary condition so that it doesn't pose a threat to public health, uh, safety, or welfare. We expect a lot out of our uh, envelope of the building. Uh, it's an environmental separator. Uh, it keeps the outside out and keeps the inside in. Um, <clears throat> it's completely exposed to the elements, and of course it provides a, an aesthetic architectural appearance uh, for the building. Uh, water may be the number one ingredient for, for nice landscaping. However, it's the number one enemy for uh, 
building structures that are exposed, uh, and, and building envelopes. Uh, in addition to that, you have uh, natural aging of uh, organic materials, sealants, roofing, things of that nature. Uh, they try to break down over time to, to their original constituents. Uh, and then you've got leakage, of course, of water that uh, through the roof walls, windows, two types of windows, those that leak and those that are going to leak. And so it's important to have secondary drainage systems uh, within your windows and, and curtain walls. Uh, another uh, source of deficiencies for building envelopes is uh, differential movement between materials. Um, and uh, thermally, uh, some materials expand and contract uh, more or less than others. Uh, moisture, uh, absorption, um, and evaporation will cause materials to expand and contract. Elastic deformation is when you uh, put dead load or live load on a structural element and it deflects uh, elastically, which means that when you take the load away, it goes back to its original shape. Uh, you can also have creep. Uh, what that is, is when you have a sustained dead load on a structure, it could be wood or concrete, um, and uh, that, that sustained dead load will cause a permanent deformation that does not return to its original shape uh, when the load is removed. And then we, we have the uh, occasional occurrence of uh, impact damage vehicles uh, contacting uh, the exterior of a building um, and uh, lightning strikes. And we've got a photograph of an example that we investigated in uh, Tennessee. Uh, water intrusion makes up about 70% of all construction litigation. Uh, and it's a source of a lot of problems with uh, building facades. Um, the damage functions are, of course, water, uh, but then uh, you, get, you get rot and rust and things of that nature that uh, with heat uh, from the sun, the atmosphere, um, the, the heat actually accelerates the, the chemical uh, degradation of, of building materials. Um, as does ultraviolet radiation that will break down uh, organic materials, including roofing and, and sealants. And you can see here, um, the darkest blue areas uh, are, are the most uh, exposed to moisture, followed by the lighter blue and then the rest of the building there. You can see dark blue at the base. This is water that's either, either splashing up onto the base of the building or being drawn up through capillary action uh, from groundwater. Uh, there's a couple principles uh, with regard to building science. Uh, one is that 90% of water intrusion problems occur within 1% of the total building exterior. Uh, and that typically occurs at terminations of, of waterproofing and transitions. Uh, we'll see on an upcoming slide that a lot of uh, drawings that show um, the terminations of waterproofing don't show the transitions to adjacent systems. So if you have curtain wall, say next to a uh, cavity wall or something you know, with stone cladding, uh, unless you put details on your drawings for those transitions from one type of material to the other, the contractor's kind of left with wondering what to do and typically that's answered with putting a bunch of sealant on there that may only last a couple years. And next thing you know, you've got water uh, coming in your building. Uh, the other principle uh, with building science is 99% of the water intrusion problems are attributable to human error, including detailing specifications or installation, not material or systems failure. So even though you have a warranty uh, for your material, the failure is typically not your material. It's typically that either it was not detailed properly, as I mentioned, uh, wasn't specified, you didn't have the right sealant uh, for that particular joint size or the amount of movement anticipated, or uh, it's just installed properly. The substrate may not have been prepared properly. And I tried to circle up all of the areas here that uh, are transitions and terminations of the building. This is certainly not all by, by any means, but you could see you know, I could probably add a lot more circles, but you can see there's a lot of locations that are potential areas uh, for water intrusion.
Uh, most uh, architectural drawings that you'll see uh, will have a number of uh, two-dimensional details, as you can see here on the left. However, you run into a situation which is quite common on, um, on, a, on a building on the, on the right there. Uh, unless you draw a three-dimensional detail, you really, can't, you really can't convey how to tie all this waterproofing together. And like I mentioned, the answer to the unknown information is more sealant that could last, you know, a couple of years compared to maybe 30, 40 years uh, of the building material or the waterproofing material itself.